I want to start this morning by saying thank you for the time off last week. Uh, as you heard, Travis and I got the opportunity to go uh, into the mountains of New Mexico, just the two of us, and sit in a cabin and do nothing uh, for about five days. So it was a really great gift. Um, we actually were able to do it because one of the members here who's often traveling, Stacy Hargrave, uh, recommended uh, myself to be the pastor um, at their little outdoor chapel on Sunday. So if you do that, you get the cabin for free. Um, so it was really quite lovely. And now I am refreshed to head into uh, the super fun seasons like stewardship and Advent uh, that are just around the corner if we can believe that those are upcoming. Um, it's funny because in my seven or eight years here, I've actually only been present for one Laity Sunday um, because it's my birthday weekend and Deborah used to let me um, take it off since we weren't needed up front. Uh, but I really love the idea of it, even if I've not been present for a lot of them, because it is a great opportunity for other people to really share in the leadership of God's church. It's not just my job and Tomas's job or the elder's job. It's all of our jobs. And Lady Sunday is when um, some of us are lovingly forced into that activity. Because when we ask, um, people get to explore if they like being an upfront person. And a lot of people will say, yeah, we'll do this every once in a while. Every, occasionally, there's someone who says, please never ask me again hated every second of that. Um, it's rare, but there are people who we just kind of cross off the list. We are not upfront people, and we honor that because we are all gifted in different things. Like Tomas talked with the children, there are some of us who really prefer to be behind the scenes, who want to set up communion in, a, in the morning, who want to clean up the pews afterwards. They don't want to be seen, but they want to be served. And there are others who like to be seen, but don't like to talk. Maybe they like to serve communion and hand out the offering trays. There are some people who just love to talk. So they say yes to being an elder, yes to being a scripture reader, other opportunities like that. Some people love to lead committees, and other people like to be on committees. And some of us like to make sure the church's finances are in order, and others like to make sure that we're doing our responsible outreach into the community and serving God in new ways every season. It could, I could go on and on about all the different ways that we serve God both up front and behind the scenes, things that make us comfortable and things that stretch us a little bit. Uh, but there's so many more than I could ever list. And even more so, our service to God isn't just here in this building. We should be going out into the world, and this might ruffle some people, but I would say the service you do in the world is more important than the service you do in here. We can do all that we want in here, but if we're not serving out in the world on committees, on school boards, on um, outreach groups, by feeding the hungry, by welcoming people, then what we're doing in here isn't as powerful if we're not taking it out. But please do not stop volunteering in the church building. That wasn't a either or. It's a both and type of situation. Please don't give up on me just yet and on the things we do inside of here. Because remember, we're told to go and make disciples. We're told to get out of our comfort zone. That's what we're called to do. And this morning, I know my dad gave a teaser last week that we're going to start looking at vocation, which is the fancy church word for calling or what we do with our lives, both professionally and in kind of our hobbies and activities like that. So I wanted to know very briefly what you wanted to be as a kid and if that's what you are now. I will give an example. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a rock scientist, like rocks on the ground scientists. I am not that. What did somebody else want to be? Andrew? A secret agent. Are you, are you allowed to tell us if you're a secret agent? Okay, right. <laughs> what did somebody else want to be? Yeah. Bryce wanted to be a marine biologist, and we thank God that you are not that. <laughs> Though you do have a turtle, right? 
A frog, you saw that, yes. <laughs> Your degree is a marine biologist? Okay, I love it. You learn something new every day. Any, anybody else? A baker? I love it. Say it again. A teacher and singer. So good job, right? You did it. <laughs> Little you is so proud. Teacher and singer. Teacher and singer. I love it. I love it. One more. Anybody else? You want it to be Van Cliburn. Is this a Texas reference that I don't get? Okay. <laughs> okay. Concert pianist in the world. Excellent. All right. Okay, yeah, raise your hands if you are what you wanted to be. Nancy, Sherry. We got some. I love it. I love seeing these dreams realized, but it's also fun when we have different dreams, when we grow into things, because we do evolve as who we want to be. Even if you wound up doing your dream, other parts of your life probably look different than you thought it would look as a child. Sometimes, as we've seen a lot of us got to be what we wanted to be, others, that's a hobby like we have amphibians uh, that we help, I'm gonna stick with amphibian, um, that we help raise. And sometimes we did something for a little bit and then that season ended and we went on to do something else. I'm sure we're all familiar with the phrase that you have to walk before you can run. You have to learn one skill before you can do another. I think our educators call it scaffolding. You have to build on top of other things. The purpose of learning to walk is not so that you can learn to run and never walk again. You do still walk in life. Most of us probably walk more than we run. Both skills are important even as they build on top of each other. The same is true for our ages. While childhood and a young adulthood prepare us to be adults, those ages are also important in their own rights. They have value just as they are. You can't just skip over childhood and become an adult and be perfect and say, I didn't need to do any of that. So in this vocation sermon series, we are going to take Sundays and look at those ages as things that have value in their own right not just as stepping stones to something bigger, but things that are their own. One of the authors that I read said that every stage of life is, yes, preparing for the next, but also exists in its own right. We are building blocks out of blocks that are important on their own. A quick little uh, language lesson, the Greek word ekklesia, means church. That's what we refer to. The ecclesia is the church, but it also contains the verb to call. Ecclesia contains the verb to call. And so earliest Christian communities, when they labeled themselves as this, as an ecclesia, they understood they were not just a community, but a community with a calling to something, a calling to be a believer of of everyone of all ages, all groups together. Remember, at this time in the early Christianity, they were meeting in houses. And that means everyone was there together, tumbled on top of each other, the babies and the children in there with the adults all learning and growing together. Ecclesia, a community called together, valuing each life in the room. I'm going to be a little creative in a rereading of the scripture today, this last part, verses six through eight. And what if it read like this? We have different ages according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is childhood, then have wonder. If your gift is youth, then make mistakes. If your gift is long life, then share what you have learned. When we go across these age stages, there is something that is blended together that makes each one of us better because our callings, our vocations are relational. We can't do it alone. When they study people who have a calling, a vocation, something that they feel driven to, a lot of times they get that because of a relationship they had with someone else. It's hard to figure out what you want to do or be if you have not seen that modeled elsewhere. An example from my own life or a lot of preachers who are women is 
they have to have seen one before they could be one. We hear that a lot in the world. You have to have seen it before you can be one. One of my pastors growing up was one of the first female pastors in our congregation. I had to see it to know that I could be it. So we need this relational aspect. We need to be able to say, that looks kind of fun. I'm going to try to do that. For now, for a season, forever, we will see how it goes. I know my dad in his sermon talked about Miss Sherry, who taught me Sunday school by myself for years in this little church that I grew up at. But I also want to talk about uh, how we did potlucks at, uh, the church was called the Kirk of the Corners. And It was a church plant, so when the land was bought and the building was built, they built the church building back off of the property because it was supposed to be the fellowship hall when we grew and built out. So we started out as a sanctuary and fellowship hall together with classrooms off to the side. We never grew to build that sanctuary closer to the road, so when we had potlucks, everyone had to flip the room together. So as soon as worship was over, the benediction was said, the prayer for the meal was said, everyone jumped up and moved their chairs to the side. People started grabbing folding tables and setting them up. Some people went to the kitchen to start pulling out the food. Others started pushing the chairs back under, and we could get that room flipped in a matter of moments from worship space to meal space. Because everyone knew they had a job and that they were important in the transformation of that room. I can remember a little Allison pushing these big, heavy chairs out of the way. And no one told me, oh, go sit down and stay out of the way. My work in that space was valued because all ages were valued there. There's a theologian, Karl Barth, who recognizes that vocation is also the place where God meets us. It's a place where God comes into our lives and says, you have gifts for this. Let's explore that. Let's grow that together. But I think it's not just where God meets us. It's also where we meet each other. Because as Tomas told the kids, if we all have the same vocation and gift, we're not going to get as far. If we're all gifted singers, it might be beautiful in this room, But then what about our outreach? What about our finances? What about our property? We all have to have different gifts and different ways to serve the Lord, and we do that together. Our scripture for today reminds us that God's love should transform us and should encourage us to a life of worship and service and humility. We should recognize that we all have a part to play in God's plan. And that part does not change based on who or what we are. The part is given to us from God, no matter the strength of our body or minds, our education level, our income status, our marital status, or the family system that we come from or create, no matter our age, God has a purpose for us in this family system has a purpose for how we live out together, how we serve. I'm also going to pull from 1 Corinthians today. This is a verse that many of us probably know in our uh, hearts, if not verbatim. And remember it says, Now if the foot would say to the hand, then I do not belong to the body because I am not the hand, it would not stop being a part of the body. Or if the ear should say, I am not the eye, I don't belong in the body and would not stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would hearing be? But in fact, God has placed these parts on the body, every one of them, just like he wanted them to be. God has placed these parts together as God wanted them to be. Again, this is one we could change for ages. We could say, If we were all children, where would we be? If we were all young adults, if we were all middle-aged, if we were all advanced in age, where would we be? Instead, God says, I want each one of you here. Paul loves this body imagery. He uses it a lot to remind us of the purpose that we serve reminds us that we can't look at someone a different age of us and say, you aren't important yet, or you are past the age of being important. 
We can't say to the children, just wait, it's not your turn yet. We can't say to those who are older than us, oh, you're done. Just sit down. We are all important. We all have parts to play, different parts, but important parts. And we're supposed to work together to figure it out. So in the next few weeks, we're going to explore that. We're going to look at each age range and the gifts that they can bring to us from the family of God. We're going to look at what it looks like to be the ecclesia, the church that is called to be a community of God. Let us pray. Ever-loving God, you have created us to be a family. You have called each one of us with our strengths, with our weaknesses, with our similarities, with our differences. You have looked at each one of us and called us good. Help us to look around us and see that light, that goodness shining in each one of us and honor our differences, Lord, just as we celebrate our similarities. We give all thanks and praise to you. Amen and amen. If you would like to join a Christian community, either by transferring your membership or saying yes to God for the first time, uh, we would love to have you be a part of East Dallas Christian Church. And you can come stand up front with me uh, as we all stand and sing hymn 543.